All right, let's get going again. So it's uh, Wasim al Sindi uh, over here again, calling in from Berlin. I'm recording this uh, after midnight, uh, so it's now uh, already um, Monday morning. Um, I suppose it's about 5 p.m. Sunday uh, where you are on the West Coast. Um, and so, uh, you know, having done the kind of uh, introductory framing and this kind of background, epistemological background, and, and uh, uh, showing you some of the kind of commonalities of, of taxonomic work in the past. I want to present you now we'll focus a bit more on token space itself and um, uh, show you how it might be used and how one can build a token space and, and um, what, what insights can be gleaned from something like that. Okay, so let's, let's jump in. So um, I left you uh, a little bit before the break uh, with this, uh, you know, the William Hinman sufficiently decentralized comments in June 2018 and this idea that you know, something that started off as a thing that then became not a thing. It has to pass through some kind of boundary or some kind of, you know, uh, phase uh, uh, separation. Um, you know, so how did it change? What what changed? Why did it change? When did it change? And so on. And so, you know, we talk about whether these tokens are securities or not. We talk about whether these things are monies or not. Um, I think most people agree that these things look quite a lot like commodities. I mean, in fact, you could probably argue a quite a strong case that these things are um, in some ways like the best digital commodities that ever, ever have ever existed. They're highly tradable. People speculate on them. They're not uh, consumable, but they are transformable in some senses, uh, smart contracts and, uh, and uh, uh, multi-token systems and what have you. Um, I guess you could say that they're consumable if you have a, a proof of burn or a burn uh, component in a project. But anyway, those are the details. So the reason I mentioned these three things, commodity, security and money, is because in this kind of initial instantiation of token space, which I built in this manuscript, now bear in mind that token space is a general, it's a general um, technique. You can build a, a, a token space with any number of dimensions, with, and each of those dimensions can, can be different than the ones I've built. You can build them with different taxonomies than the one I've built. It could be completely different to what I've done. Or you could use exactly the same one that I've done. So it's really up to you. I've built a generalizable framework um, so that uh, people can derive, do, build derivatives and build uh, offshoots of it. So here's a very simple schematic of token space. This is what first came into my mind when I, when I, when I, when I came up with this idea. Um, the idea that you could have a multidimensional, let's say 3D, you know, because we're three-dimensional creatures, uh, idealized space within which you could, you know, populate uh, uh, um, the space, let's say between zero and one on each axis. Um, you can populate, put an asset or a point in that, an object in that space, and you determine its coordinates, its position in the space, based on a weighted scoring of some taxonomies that you build using the Nickerson methodology that I mentioned earlier. And so, um, first we're going to show you some boring looking uh, uh, word salad and then we're going to look at some pictures. So I've tried to get through the, the word salad quite quickly so we can spend a bit more time thinking and talking about the pictures. So this is kind of like an a la carte menu of all the different what are called characteristics in this Nickerson uh, taxonomy sense. So the, the characteristics, this is kind of like the laundry list of the things that you wish to discriminate with. So in analogy to biological systems, you would be talking about how many legs does the creature have? Does it suck at its young? Does it uh, have body hair? Uh, does it have a thorax? And these things will help you determine whether is it an arthropod? Is it an insect? Is it a mammal? And so on. And so here we've got things like, is it proof of work? Is it proof of stake? Does it have governance? Uh, how is the treasury supply con control managed? Is the power asymmetry between issuers and investors? Um, uh, what's the you know what's the issuance mechanism at the start? What's the issuance mechanism ongoing? And so I built this like a, you know this is at this stage where I was ideating as many different useful parameters as possible, and then I would determine then later determine which of those would go in each of the three sets of taxonomies uh, that we built. And so you can see actually on this uh, slide, you can see this S. M and C, and those represent which characteristics, um, uh, uh, which taxonomies they ended up in, which meta characteristics they end up in. The meta characteristic is the Nickerson idea of the kind of overarching thing that you're discriminating against. So in this case, securityness, the taxonomy there, you're trying to discriminate how much of a security is something. Moneyness, you're trying to look at how the qualities or the properties of this thing resemble, do they resemble a good money, and so on. 
So this is a bit of a closer grain detail on the security in this taxonomy. So it, the taxonomy itself is just a big table. And they're almost impossible to plot nicely in, in uh, 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 A4 slides. So I recommend you take a look at the token space manuscript. It's uh, handily, handily linked right there. Um, and so um, it's also at tokenspace.pubpub.org. It's a bit easier to read on the web-based uh, format. So what you can see here are some of the different uh, characteristics that I picked out, you know, like network functionality, rights to cash flows, governance type, balance between stakeholder participants. And then these things would be scored between zero and one. And this is how you get your kind of weighted scores. And then you would, each of these characteristics would have then a weighting attached to that. And then that would squash all of these scores down into one number. And that's the number that determines the axial coordinate. And then you have the three different axes, which tells you where your asset is in that token space. So what you're doing here is really dimensional reduction. You're taking many parameters, <clears throat> you're squashing them into one. And this is a bit like what price does. So we've all seen those price charts, whether it's Bitcoin or um, orange juice or oil. The oil chart is particularly interesting at the moment. Uh, take a look at that if you want to have a laugh. Um, and so what does price do? Price, like we said in that Gobbity and Johnson frame, uh, framework, the network capital, it squashes all these objective and subjective factors in the moment into the price. And token space is doing something kind of similar to that, right? It's taking a number of subjective and objective parameters and squashing them into something that we can parameterize and we can plot on a chart. So this is really important. So we talked about subjectivity and objectivity a few times in the past, and this slide I just tried to really uh, hit it home. So you know, we live in this kind of uh, world where we balance between subjective and objective uh, uh, parameters. We make our choices based on partial information, um, and you know we have this also kind of idea that the more objective something is, the better. But I'm not always sure that's true, and so and the reason I say that is because of this thing that you may have heard of called Goodhart's Law. And Goodhart's Law is not really like a true physical law, it's more like a kind of economic, a rule of thumb used a lot in economics. But the idea basically being that when a, a measure becomes, uh, or when a method becomes a measure, something that's used to benchmark or, or, or parameterize the performance of something, then it becomes a target for optimization and it will be gamed and people will manipulate it. Then it ceases to be a good measure. So this is what I call Goodhart manipulability. And a very good example of that is imagine a fictional country, uh, Extremistan, and they have a very interesting regulatory framework for cryptocurrencies there. And so their framework is very simple. They say if there's more than 10,000 nodes on your network, you're sufficiently decentralized and uh, you uh, don't have to obey securities regulations. So that's obviously very desirable for the, any issue of an upstart network. So say, for example, I've got my own coin, uh, Wasim token. And uh, I have less than 10,000 nodes on my network and I'm worried about uh, the extremist and securities and exchange commission uh, paying me a visit. So I can get on the phone to Jeff Bezos and say, hey Jeff, can you spin me up 10,000 nodes please? I need them really soon. And Jeff will say, yep, sure, just uh, send us some money, done. So now I've got 10,000 nodes on my network. And now the extremist and SEC says that I'm sufficiently decentralized. But all I really did was game a system. So that's why this good heart manipulability means that purely objective parameters are very hard to build that resist this gaming. And that's why there's always an element of judgment, an element of, uh, of uh, jurisprudence, I guess you could say, in certain contexts to try and separate out the intentionality of a lot of the actions and the kind of messy in-between zones, category errors that we see in uh, legal cases around this world. So the other thing to say is if you go too far on the objective, uh, subjective side, then, well, that's just subjectivity, right? That's just your biases, your opinions. Um, why should we care what you think? Why should you care what I think? Um, you know, then we, we back up all the kind of the fallacies and the appeals to authority and all the rest of it, um, bias and, and lack of reproducibility. And so really, like, you have to choose your epistemological poison with token space based on the characteristics and the weightings you put into your taxonomy, you determine where you live on this uh, sliding scale. And um, and that's kind of, uh, I guess it's problematic in some senses because you don't get something that's an absolute promise of truth. But really, if anybody's promising you absolute truth, you should be uh, uh, treating that with extreme skepticism. So 
Here's a table with some um, sample scores based on uh, the outputs of the taxonomies. Oh, excuse me. Um, and so uh, here I've put in some non-cryptocurrencies to give you a sense of like what you call ideal or extreme types to give you kind of a way to benchmark the the the, the opposite the, the, the extreme ends of the scale. So for securityness, like how much for security an asset uh, resembles, how security like a, an asset is. I mean, the securityness of one is just a security. So we said Apple stock. I mean, it's a security. What more can you can you say than that? It, is, it does what it says on the tin. And the other extreme, you could say that a lump of rock or some soybeans. I mean, that is definitely not a security. There's no kind of agreement. There's no underlying. There's no you know none of the legs of the Howie test or um, the you know family resemblance or, or uh, um, Silver Hills collective capital risk. None of that exists in a lump of metal or a pile of beans. And so you could say with a quite a lot of certainty that everything else is going to kind of fall in between those things. And so here you've got a few different scores. We'll come back to those a, a little bit later, but I think one, one thing that's interesting is to look at kind of time values, how some of these things can, can change from one time to another. So that's me trying to um, uh, offer a post hoc rationalization of Hindman's comments, sufficiently decentralized comments. Uh, and so you could say if you're charitable, some people are more charitable than others, um, but I'll be charitable here and say that Ethereum of 2019 and 2020 is a very different animal than the Ethereum of 2014, 15 and 16. Many people are running the software, and many uh, developers and, and, and companies participate in the ecosystem. And uh, even though there's still a foundation and there's still a spectre of the token sale, this thing looks a very different proposition than it did uh, four or five, six years ago. Okay, this is moneyness. And I won't go too close to into any of these uh, uh, things. This is perhaps something we can discuss uh, uh, after this video is finished in the Zoom call. And um, I tried also to distinguish here between uh, different kinds of, of precious metal money, because um, you know if you look through the history of money, and I do try to to talk about this in uh, section 1.3 of the token space manuscript, um, you know going from like lumps of rock to uh, coins which are kind of struck with a consistent weight and then milled coins with um, with the kind of edges on the sides uh, and other anti-counterfeiting measures. These things become better monies because they become more fungible and the level of trust that goes into them is higher. Obviously, they're still the kind of, as you get more towards state coinage, these are like fiat money, abstractions of faith in the underlying system or the government or the financial prudence of the, of the nation state of the day. Um, um, yes, let's let's move on and we can come back to these things in more detail later. And then commodity nurse, like again, um, I think these scores are probably quite a lot higher than, than the moneyness ones in general, especially for cryptocurrencies. I did try to make a distinction here between um, pre-Bretton Woods and post-Bretton Woods USD. So obviously pre-Bretton Woods, there was the gold standard. So um, uh, fiat currency was uh, literally and directly exchangeable, redeemable for underlying the underlying collateral, you could say, I suppose, if you're talking loosely of um, of the gold sitting in Fort Knox or, or wherever else. Um, and obviously that's gone now. So uh, you could argue that uh, USD is no longer commodity money. And so it's less, got less commodity than, than it had before. I mean, you could also, by the same token, say that no money is still commodity money. No state money is still commodity money. Okay, so let's look at some pictures. Everyone loves pictures. So this is a, a token space using the same parameters we just discussed. Uh, securityness uh, going up, let me just get the pointer, security is going up, commodityness is going across, and moneyness going deep. And then what this is, you can think of this as like a regulatory boundary function or a boundary surface. And so this is just some like equation I plotted, it doesn't mean anything. Um, so if, you, if the scores don't make sense to you, it's literally just before I did that deliberately so people wouldn't use this. It's absurd actually, but I don't want people to use it and misuse it. So. Um, what you can imagine is this kind of like it's a boundary surface going through space. And if your asset sits above this thing in space, it's too security like for the kind of um, imagine a, 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 the extremist and Securities and Exchange, Exchange Commission developed this to, to help their kind of um, asset issuers in their jurisdiction understand their compliance regime. And so you can imagine maybe not something as, dis as discreet as a line in the sand, a direct line, maybe something like a phased traffic light system or kind of cloud zones. 
like a you know red, yellow, and green kind of thing, uh, telling you about your likely level of compliance. Now again, remember token space is subjective, so that the way that this would be scored would depend on the extremist and SEC. So here's a, a token space with the top ten assets uh, taken about a year ago, based on the obviously admittedly terrible uh, metric of market capitalization, um, and so. What we've got here is like a way that we can start to, as I said, start to tease apart the similarities and differences, look for clusters or families or different types, so sorts of tokens. And so again, moneyness uh, going depth ways, commodityness along the x or along the bottom axis, and securityness on the on the, the height axis. And so you know, Bitcoin really does seem to be out on its own. I mean, maybe you're seeing some of my biases here. Maybe I'm, I'm a Bitcoin maximalist and I just haven't told you that. Um, but I think um, most people would agree by now that Bitcoin is out on its own. Bitcoin is sui generis, it's unique in its own right. It was the first and therefore it's got that first mover monetary advantage that, that, that currencies seem to, seem to uh, uh, display. Um, and also it's, it's got a very strong, very high commodity -ness. It's not very security-like. I mean, there's no leader, there's no expectation of profit, there's no investment contract. There's no underlying, so I suppose this thing is not very security-like at all. Then let's move to the center of the, the domain. Here's Ethereum. It's less commodity-like and less money-like than Bitcoin. Um, it's more security-like than Bitcoin. I suppose that might be because of the foundation, these like high-profile leaders, the founders, and so on, and also the fact that they did a token sale way back when. And so then you've got this kind of mini cluster here of proof of work coins, Bitcoin derived proof of work coins, BCH and LTC. Now they're less of a money than Bitcoin because less people accept them. They're less good as a commodity just because there's less liquidity, less market, less acceptability and, and all the rest of it. Less uh, brand uh, uh, recognition, if you would. And they're more security like because they've got these centralized foundations and they've got leaders and they've got, you know, all these other kind of uh, ecosystem funds and other things like that. Here's USDT, Tether, which I don't believe to be well mapped by this current instantiation of token space. So if anybody wants to extend token space to make it work better with the stable coins or even build its own, your own stable coin space, I'd really encourage that. So please drop me a line if you're interested in doing that. I'll happily um, uh, give you some pointers and, and uh, a little bit of guidance. Then I would say that you're in this kind of federated network zone here with uh, um, Ripple and Stellar. Um, now they're not very good monies. They're not very good commodities either. Um, I guess I guess that might be because transactions can get censored or cancelled, and these federations um, you require to be whitelisted to be able to 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 have um, certain privileges uh, running a node on the network. And a lot of the token supply is locked up by insiders or or funds or founders and so on. So these things don't look great as monies, and they're very security-like. Um, and then the, up here you've got kind of the class of 2017, which I don't want to go into for, 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 for a number of reasons, but they look awfully security-like and not very money or commodity-like, uh, according to my instantiation of token space that I'm showing the outputs of here anyway. So when you've got these um, uh, uh, parameters and scores, you can engage in uh, statistical computing. You can look for clusters. Like, you know, so we saw these kind of families that we could eyeball. Well, here's uh, we're using k-means nearest neighbors statistical analysis to actually kind of really mathematically discretize and look for different numbers of, of clusters. So here I'm looking for three clusters. Here I'm looking for four. Here I'm looking for five. And here I'm looking for six. So I would say yeah, none of them model it perfectly because I mean, with 10 data points, it's of limit, limited meaningfulness. But I would say that it's a useful exercise nonetheless to accompany this uh, kind of um, uh, expert judgment, your own personal opinions. I wouldn't rely on any one or the other uh, absolutely. Again, this is extreme objectivity, so it's kind of manipulable and, and uh, may not be that meaningful. And then on the other side, your, you know, your... Um, uh, uh, um, taking the temperature yourself, so you're, you're, you're on the subjective realm. And so um, here's another example of statistical computing you can do. This is a hierarchical clustering. So you're trying to sort them out based on how similar or different they are one by one. And so here, this is almost like, um, imagine how the US Postal Service works. Like, you know, they've got a big like lorry full of letters and parcels and, and postcards and all the rest of it. And there's, there's probably some big machine somewhere that's just sorting all these things out. That's a postcard goes over there. That's a parcel goes over there. Da, 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 da. And so um, this is kind of like a, a sorting machine. 
So at first it sorted out Bitcoin. It's like, well, that's different. Put it over there. Then it's looking between these two. Then it's looking between these two, these two, and then these three. And so those are quite similar to the clusters we saw before visually and also by the k-means clustering. Again, with 10 data points, this is not of, you know, that much meaningfulness, but I just want to illustrate uh, what you can do with this technique. And so if you take um, the idea of these three dimensions as kind of like a spatial representation of our reality, of our universe, obviously we have a fourth dimension, which is time. And you can add time into your token space to build time dependent models. You can score these things over time, or as I've done here, you can just plot them in an indicative sense. So this slide's obviously way too busy with way too many things on it. So let's spit it out a bit. So here's Bitcoin. Bitcoin at its birth, at inception in 2009. I mean, when it was just Satoshi and Hal, it's not really decentralized, is it? I mean, so the securityness has been decreasing over time. I mean, it was never really very security-like, but you could say as it's, as it's uh, matured, it's become less. It's become better money. It's become a better commodity over time. I would still say it's got a long way to go to being a good money. And um, perhaps, you know, the recent uh, market volatility in the, um, the wake of the uh, coronavirus disruptions uh, lends testament to that. I mean, if your money can lose 50% of its value in a blink of an eye, that is a problem. I mean, like we are very happy to line up taking dumps on the Venezuelan Bolivar and the Petro, but I mean, they're less volatile than Bitcoin is on a bad day. So make of that what you will. And here's Ethereum. So Ethereum is an interesting one because as we said, you know, it started off looking very security-like, that baby little Ethereum up here with a very high security-ness. As time's gone on, if you're charitable, then you could say the network's proliferated, it's become used, it's become useful. Ethereum is this kind of like digital uh, commodity, a, a, a consumable digital commodity, like digital oil that you use to run smart contracts. How useful you think Ethereum smart contracts are is another matter. Uh, but I would say at least, at the very least, Ethereum is a reasonable substrate for experimentation and uh, it does have some utility in that sense as a kind of uh, petri dish or a laboratory. Maybe a place to do, to look for toy solutions to toy problems. Maybe a place to look for toy solutions to real problems. Maybe not a place to look for real solutions to real problems, in my opinion. Anyway, let's move on. Here's XRP. Now, XRP doesn't seem to have changed very much. And like, I would also say that that is borne out by the lack of development, lack of fun additional functionality. Indeed, I would go as far as to say that the original Ripple coin had more functionality than XRP. So XRP was meant to be the currency to pay to attach a file to the Ripple coin network or the Ripple network. You were meant to pay one XRP. That was meant to be the fee to attach a thing to uh, uh, upload to this network. And so and it's even lost that functionality. So you could argue that this thing has very high securityness. Um, a lot of the insiders and the you know Ripple Labs they they hold the huge amounts of this uh, of this of the supply and they sell that on the open market, um, which uh, may raise eyebrows to those of you that uh, know something about securities laws and regulations. And indeed, there is a very long-lasting and ongoing conversation about whether um, this thing is really. Um, uh, compliant in a regulatory sense. Okay, let's look at gold. So gold, I mean, it's never been security-like. We're talking about lumps of gold here, like uh, the rock, dumb rock. It's never been security-like. You could argue that it's becoming less of a good money over time. And you could argue that it's still quite a good commodity. Um, maybe it's become a better commodity over time as the markets have matured. Um, and so the reason that I suppose it's come out as looking like less of a good money over time is the demonetization of precious metals. So it used to be that the gold standard was the kind of universal standard and, you know, the, the currencies which um, propelled the trading empires of Portugal, Holland and the UK were built on metallic standards. And so obviously one by one, these metallic standards have all gone. And so gold is now um, more of a commodity than a money. I would argue. Okay, and then USD. So for a little bit of fun, let's look at the dollar. So you could argue that, uh, you know, <laughs> at the time of the Great Fork between the UK and the USA in uh, approximately 1792, um, the USD was not a great money, not at that stage. And in, indeed, in, during the kind of 18th and 19th century, there was this wild kind of bank banking era where pretty much everybody around the US was printing their own money and banks were going bust and people getting ruined and, you know, uh, 
uh, scammers making fortunes. I don't know if that reminds you of anything uh, that we've been talking about recently, but uh, there's certainly some parallels to the white wildcat banking era in uh, cryptocurrency. So you could argue that as time went on and the United States became the economic powerhouse that um, uh, it remains to be this day, uh, that the usefulness of, 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 uh, of the USD has increased, it's become a better money and it became a better commodity. Probably peaking like in the post-World War I uh, era between World War One and World War Two, as uh, the US really became the kind of um, industrial powerhouse of the world. And then, you know, as time's gone on, uh, the money printer's been going burr, as, uh, as all the memes say, and the, um, you know, every day we wake up at the moment in the COVID scene in March 2020, and the money printer's been printing trillions of dollars every day. And trillions of dollars sound like a lot of money. So if you're printing trillions of dollars every day, and there's no uh, end to the potential debasement of your supply, it kind of makes your currency look less valuable, less less of a good money. So I would argue that this thing may be tilting back now to becoming less of a good money. Um, and also because it's not backed by anything, you could argue it's becoming a bit more of a, a bit more security-like. You almost like, um, you could frame the USD as an abstraction of faith in the policies of the Federal Reserve, the Treasury, and, and even the US government, the you know uh, meme, meme lord in, in chief. Um, and so, uh, yes, you could, uh, there are plenty of dire predictions for the dollar's future and uh, we'll, we'll see how things pan out, I suppose. So, um, quick side note on, on this Crypto Ratings Council thing. I don't know if anybody saw this a few months ago. Um, this was a kind of consortium, including Coinbase and a few other people. They wanted to come up with some ratings to help uh, regulators uh, better understand the similarities and differences of these things. And I you know, obviously perked my eyebrows up when I saw this thinking, oh, that looks a bit like my thing, security score between one and five. Oh, interesting. Um, but what they didn't do was tell you like every every score of everything that they put in here. Now, I haven't actually kept up the developments on this thing. I don't know if it went anywhere. Um, but apparently there were some five out of fives, like, you know, def definitely a security. Um, but um, perhaps they were even less brave than I am uh, in, in putting this token space work out there. Because if you say something's a five and you're an industry consortium, that's fighting talk, you know, like, and these people have lawyers and, you know, people in the States like to sue each other. So um, be careful of that out there. And so, um, yeah, we'll, we'll wrap it up there. Very happy to um, answer some questions, have some discussion in the in the, in the the Zoom. And uh, there's a couple of links there. So tokenspace.plel.com and tokenspace.pubpub.org are places you can find more token space related materials. And if you want to look up the journal and the conference series that I'm working on, and, uh, you know, Summer is part of that project as well. So she's a very... A valuable member of our peer review committee helping us decide which papers uh, we should accept and which ones we should uh, put to one side then take a look at uh, the website www.cryptoeconomic.systems and thanks very much for your attention cheers